Nathan, how you doing, man? Good to have you on. Thanks for having me. Yeah, heck yeah. So I'm so excited to talk to you. Glad, you know, I'm just honored to have you on this podcast because, uh, you know, we went, a couple of my friends and my girlfriend, we went to the California Science Center, I think, right? right. Yeah. California Science Center. Um, and, you know, my friends were like, hey, you want to go check out this Lego exhibit from this guy who's doing crazy stuff? And I'm like, yeah, sounds cool, but had no idea what I was in for, man. It is freaking sweet what you do. Thank you very much. Yeah, I've had a lot of fun putting that exhibition together over the past decade or so. So I'm yeah. glad you enjoyed it. Man, very cool. Yeah. And it says, so it's a decade old, that exhibition, or it, that's how long you've been working on it? Well, it, it's always grown. When it started, it was less than two dozen pieces. And it was you know a small exhibition. I've just kept adding and adding to it over the years. And it's grown and grown to, to the point. And now it's actually up to five separate exhibitions. So, what? Yeah. No, I, I have five shows that tour the globe. Uh, so it's, it's crazy. It's, it's Dude. been, it's been a wild ride. Like I never expected. I did that first solo show and I thought, oh yeah, this will be fun. I'll do one little show and that'll be the end of it. I'll never, ever probably do another museum show in my life. And here we are, you know, over 10 years later, five shows touring. Uh, so it's, it's been an exciting, exciting trip. Wow. That's crazy. So that means I just saw one of your shows and you got four others going on. Right. Exactly. Simultaneously. Jeez, man, that's awesome. Congrats, Nathan. That's, Thank that's you. killer. Thank you. And what's also crazy is, you know, I, I've been kind of mildly into Legos my whole life. I don't go your scale. I'm just kind of doing the kits and, you know, the Apollo right. kits and that kind of stuff, just having fun. But, uh, saw the, um, Oscar statues from the Oscars like uh, a few yeah. years ago. And I was like, man, that's pretty sweet. I got to build one of those. So kind of figured, like got on the internet, figured out how to build it and, uh, you know, saw the time lapse and, and built that whole thing. And now we use it as our, um, our Oscar, you know, award for the Oscar party every year. So the winner gets their name on the plaque underneath. Oh, and build nice. that up. But I did all that. And then I go to this exhibit. I'm like, man, this looks so familiar. This guy looks familiar. This studio where he's in looks familiar. Where have I seen it? And then I see it sitting up on your shelf. I'm like, this is the guy who showed me how to build the Oscar statue. There you go. There you go. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. That was a few years ago when the Lego movie came out and yeah. uh, it was nominated for best song and they wanted to do something crazy at the Academy Awards. So we thought, well, we'll build Oscars out of Lego, then give them to members of the audience. Um, so cool. That's how yeah. that, that happened. Yeah. Yeah. There's like the famous uh, photo or gif of, of Oprah going crazy over yeah. those things. Yeah. 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 So yeah. fun, man. Um, so were you involved with the Lego movie at all or would they just kind of commission you for that? Very little. Um, I happened to be in Sydney, Australia, where uh, Animal Logic was. And Animal Logic did the animation on it. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was down there with an exhibition. And so Animal Logic had me come in for a day, and do like very light touch consulting. Um, and that was really it. And then uh, Chris and Phil, Chris uh, and Phil, the directors, um, Chris Miller, Phil Lord, uh, called me up right before the Academy Awards and said, Hey, you know, I, they had seen uh, my stuff and said, Hey, can you do an Academy Award or actually multiple Academy Awards for this idea we have for the best song, you know, performance. And that's, that's what kind of kicked it off for that part. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, that was so fun. It's so cool to see that stuff. Um, well, man, I, su I suppose we should just kind of dive into your story. So can you just give me your, um, you know, give me the the backstory of how this got started, where you were, you know, that the spiel you've given a hundred times, I'm sure, well, but it's it's cool. It's interesting. I mean, it all started when I was five years old, sure. got that first set of Lego. And uh, that's when it really was, uh, when I really discovered it uh, as a toy. And uh, then later in life, um, I would come back to it. I mean, I... Uh, I don't know if you can hear there's there's chewing under me right now. My dog is at my feet chewing on Lego bricks. So <laughs> I don't know if you can pick that up, but it's happening right below me. So okay. it took my focus away for a second. Nope. Um, yeah. So I started when I, I mean, I was I was I was a fan of Lego growing up. I had it all the time. It was something I played with. It, my parents were accepting of it, and in in so much so that I had a a thirty six square foot Lego city uh, when I was a kid, Whoa. and 
and you know, you, you get older and you kind of lose your affinity for Lego. You go to college and I still had this affinity for art though and, and wanted to explore becoming an artist. But when I got out of college, I didn't really have that faith in my art uh, to pursue it. So there's some societal pressure there to become a professional. And I just thought, oh, I'll just go to law school. Just go to law school. Sure. So I went to law school um, and practiced law in New York City, but I would come home at night and I would need that creative outlet still. And sometimes I would paint, sometimes I would draw, and sometimes I would uh, sculpt. And I sculpted out of traditional media, things like clay and wire. And then one day I just thought, you know what? I'm going to try this toy from my childhood and experimented using Lego bricks as an art form and really explored it as as a medium that could be used for sculpture and decided to eventually, well, put a little website together that was my virtual gallery and I started getting commission work. And so I was working a full day as a lawyer and I would come home at night and then do six hours of commissions uh, on Lego projects. Hmm. And eventually my website crashed from too many hits. I thought, this is it. It's time to leave the law, left the law behind, became a full-time artist. Dude, that's a cool story. Yeah, it's that's crazy. so cool that it uh, it just kind of naturally happened. It was almost like the decision was almost made for you to quit. It seems like at a point, yeah, and and it was it was a weird transition though, right? Because I was going sure. from this very secure lifestyle, secure, you know, I had a job that was I was going to say nine to five, but it was longer than that because it was legal work in New York City. But yeah. it was it was a very secure lifestyle, and then I left that to go to this very you know, weird time in my life where I didn't know if I would have, you know, the ability to pay rent the next month. It just kind of depended on what projects I was taking. Uh, so it was, it was an interesting transition, but I let my legal license expire. Like I made that choice. I am, I don't want that safety net to end up back at the law. And I just went for it. Mm -hmm. Well, I think what's cool too about your stuff is it's, um, seeing your exhibit. Well, why don't you give me, give us for people listening, give us the what your exhibit is. Well, so the art of the brick is made up of it's over a hundred. I think it's over a hundred and twenty works of art, all out of Lego bricks, and it's using that traditional Lego bricks that I had as a child to create sculptures that are more, hopefully, than just you know something you'd see in a toy store. Uh, a lot of these pieces have messaging, meaning behind them. There's some emotion there. Uh, it, it, and it, the, the art of the brick is actually broken up into different galleries. Like one gallery, I focus on works of art from art history and try and replicate these works of art that you know are well known around the globe, um, and and try and try and create them, recreate them out of Lego bricks as as a way to kind of reach a different audience about the art world, especially like young kids. Like how how would you talk to a five year old about the Mona Lisa? Well, maybe. If it's made out of a toy they're familiar with, it opens that door because yeah. they're familiar with Lego bricks. You can start the conversation and it's just a doorway. Other, other parts of the exhibition focus on more of my original work where I focus a lot on human forms and putting emotion into those human forms. Uh, there are sections of the gallery that focus on you know, more whimsy. There's, there's pieces that focus on you know, collaborations I've done with uh, photographer Dean West, where we've taken my artistic Lego sculptures and integrated them into his hyper-realistic photography. So there's there's a lot to see. The Art of the Brick is an expansive exhibition, uh, and it really, it really goes through my entire career. I mean, you see the breadth of my work over the years. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that's what I want to say was why I think it's so cool. And it's a little bit deeper than, you know, going to Legoland or something, which is cool in itself. But, right. you know, it seems like Lego kits and people who build with Lego are, you know, recreating, I don't know, like the space shuttle or something like right. that. Whereas you, you have, you, you take it from like an artist perspective, which is different, I think. Well, that's, yeah, that's exactly it. It's, it's taking this brick, this toy that everyone in the world is familiar with. Almost everyone snapped a Lego brick together at some point, but taking that and, and making it an art medium and focusing on just it as an art medium and seeing where we can go with it from there. And mm -hmm. that's, that's where I, I try and, you know, create things that the world hasn't seen before and create things that make you think a little bit. And that's, 
that's hopefully why it takes it out of that realm of what you see in a toy store. Yeah. No. Yeah. De- mission accomplished on that. Definitely does that. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so did you did you study art history, or you just kind of were interested in it and taught yourself this stuff? I took some art classes, but I I never took a, an art history uh, like 101 exactly. Yeah. So when it came to doing the art history project, it really was just self-taught. Uh, so that was, that was an interesting project of researching and really learning about the masters and really having a chance to play in their world. Because one of the things they did was take these three, these two dimensional paintings, say, uh, like, uh, the scream, right? We've got the figure screaming. So, Instead of just doing a two-dimensional version of it, I decided to take the subject matter, the figure who's screaming, and make it a 3D sculpture. And that was very fun for me because I got to play in, in the world of the masters a bit because I'm, I get to kind of come up with, well, what does the back of this figure look like? What are the sides? Because we don't know. We, you know, It's a two-dimensional painting. And getting to make that up on my own was kind of a fun way. And I think it it also works really well for Lego because Lego lends itself more to a, a 3D sculptural uh, aspect better. So I thought that was something that was a fun way to use these works of art that everyone's familiar with, but put a spin on them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's so cool. Like seeing American Gothic with the the characters right there, 3D, and you can look peek around and you know right. see their backs and stuff. It's really cool. Thanks. So, yeah. um. I'm curious about your the whole build process cuz like you know going to this exhibit we're walking around we're like damn how the hell did this guy build this thing you know it's cr- like the easter head or um oh, yeah. easter island head like jeez man that thing's gnarly so like can you kind of tell me about the process of how I mean I'm sure for something like that it's I'm sure it's different than you know Well yeah stuff. each each piece is different uh, and it just depends on the subject matter right I mean it all starts with that first spark of inspiration um, and that idea. And and that's actually, I mean, that's really where it comes from is, you know, where, when you, you have to have that inspiration to get started. And fortunately uh, having multiple exhibitions touring the globe, I've had this real uh, amazing opportunity to visit so many parts of the world, experience different cultures, meet different people and use that as as part of my inspiration. I carry a little sketchbook with me. I jot down ideas as I go, and I use that. And once I have the idea, then it, it's kind of putting it into a process of making a plan. How, how am I going to go about this? Is this something that I'm replicating, like the Venus de Milo? Because then it's it's a specific way of building so that it looks like the Venus de Milo, right? Mm -hmm. I have to know what all 360 degrees of the Venus de Milo look like, which is interesting because if I just do research on the internet, everyone takes the same photo of the Venus de Milo, the one in the front. It's hard to see the sides or the back. And so that meant going to the Louvre and being able to photograph from all angles. Um, once once I get into it, it's a very slow process. I try to envision in my mind the final piece before I put down that first brick. I'm actually gluing as I go. I have my little glue bottle right here, and I glue as I go. I am gluing each brick into place, which means if I make a mistake, I have to get out the hammer and the chisel. And I actually chisel bricks apart when when they're glued together already and it doesn't look right. Wow. So it's a very slow process. And kids often, you know, come come to me and say, how can I be you? How can I have your job? And I talk about patience as being one of the main things because these projects do not happen in a day. They take days, weeks, sometimes months. And then as you're working, you might have to chisel away hours, sometimes days worth of work. And it is heartbreaking because- yeah. You put all this time into it. You think it's going to be right. And you step back and it's like, oh, that that doesn't work. And you have to just chisel that apart. And under my desk here, I have a bucket full of chiseled bricks. Because once the chisel and the glue have set on them, they're useless after that. And they, mm-hmm. they're, no longer, they're no longer Lego bricks. They're just, wow. uh, yeah. So that's part of the process. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a slow process, uh, but it's, it's part of the fun too. And I've been told many times I go into a bit of a trance. For me, I feel like it's very therapeutic. I can just put on music and just build for hours. I mean, you you mentioned the Moai, the Moai sculpture, the Easter egg, the Easter Island head um, mm-hmm. 
uh, I mean, that piece that took uh, it took over two months. Yeah, and it was just mind numbing. I mean, it was just slow progress for that thing. <laughs> but yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, it, it was just a lot, and and there's you know when you do pieces of that scale, uh, it's hard to it's hard to figure out how it's going to come together and look right. Yeah. Working. So, I mean, cause I'm trying to like, if I was to do this stuff, I would, I think I would be, you know, I would calculate it out and, and do proportions and, and measure things and maybe even get in, there's like Lego software and stuff too. Are you using any of that kind of stuff or are you just there kind is, of. I don't use the stuff like Lego itself has something, you know, to do all those models they do for Lego mm-hmm. land and stuff. And I don't, I don't have that. What, uh, but I do use some software from time to time for like body positioning. Mm. Uh, but when it comes down to, you know, the actual building, I'm just, I'm just building one brick at a time, you know, click, click. That's amazing. I have done, um, I mean, there's some shelves over, over to the side of my studio where you see a lot of old models and they're all unglued. And the idea behind that is when I, when I started out, I would just build the model out of Lego, make sure it Mm -hmm. looks right. And then build it again, gluing it as I went. So I was mm-hmm. double building everything. And that's why I have lots of models over there that are all unglued. Nowadays, I trust my gluing and my building. So I glue as I go. Um, so that has sped up my process a little bit. But again, it gets back to the, the hammer and chisel when there's a mistake. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, I have maquettes. Like uh, in the exhibition that you saw, there's a T-Rex skeleton. And it measures yeah. about... 18, 20 feet long. And so I have a maquette of an actual T-Rex skeleton that was the basis for that. And it just sat on my desk for three months. And I learned a lot about T-Rex anatomy. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you did diving into that. Yeah. Um, one thing, especially with that thing, is we were curious about like, how do you, how do they transport this stuff between, you know, different exhibition yeah. places? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. And as I mentioned, everything is glued, right? Yeah. So fortunately, things travel fairly well. Uh, they they travel in wooden crates, just like any other statue would. Okay. Uh, the, most of the work travels just as one piece in one crate, move along. When it comes to the T-Rex, though, it's interesting yeah. you brought that one up because that's the one that actually breaks down. It breaks down into 14 different sections. And has to be reassembled each time, and that's just the nature of that skeleton, um, you know, and the way it, it's displayed. Uh, it has to be reassembled. So sometimes there's reassembling, but for the most part, everything travels fairly, fairly as one piece. Mm-hmm. Pretty much. <laughs> Pretty much. Just going through what's what's in the show. Yeah. Right. Sure. Um, and then, can you tell me about your your workspace here behind you, man? It's awesome. Like, what is your what do you have? You just got a whole inventory of every Lego piece or what's the deal there? No, not everyone, but a lot. Uh, mm-hmm. So I keep 10 million bricks on hand, you know, <laughs> modest here, yeah, here and there. Um, and the idea being that I do not want to have to think, oh, do I have enough red pieces or do I have enough of this size? I keep a large inventory so that when I'm inspired and working on a project, I can just grab bricks and start building. And that's that's the idea. So behind me, you see the bricks are organized uh, by shape and color. And so I can just grab a bin and I know exactly, you know, what is where and just grab what I need and keep building. And then I also have a warehouse where most of the bricks are kept. You know, a majority of the bricks are kept. That's where the the real inventory is. And then I have to fill this up periodically as Mm -hmm. I go. And it's, it's all organized, as I said, by shape and color. So I can quickly know what I have and what I need and... Just go for it. I, I really, when I'm in the mood to build, build, I don't want to be thinking about where's this or what's, you know, what do I need? I just want the pieces accessible. Yeah. No, it sounds like a wonderland to have all that. It seems <laughs> so fun. Um, so, okay. So I was, I was watching kind of a time lapse of um, you building, a, what was it? It was a statue. I don't I forget exactly uh-huh. which one, but um, it looked, because I've seen Legos, you know, big Lego pieces where they have like, steel structural supports yeah. inside do you ever do that kind of stuff or it looked like you were just kind of building like a, a thick wall kind of and it wasn't totally solid but it was just like a th- yeah most most of the sculptures are going to be hollow not okay. nothing nothing solid they would be way too heavy 
yeah. <laughs> if they were solid. Uh, so, but I will build structural beams out of Lego from time mm-hmm. to time, like cross beams and things within to to maintain the structure. Okay. Um, when it comes to steel, I only use it if it's necessary from a safety reason. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there has been a few pieces that have steel inside for safety purposes, but it's not usually necessary for what I'm doing. I think a lot of times you see the steel because if the public, if these if these sculptures are going to be accessible to the public and there's going to be an, a chance for like kids climbing on it, they don't want the thing to topple over. So you're going to yeah. you're going to take more safety precautions. When we talk about my work, for the most part, it's just on a pedestal. So it's not really, we hopefully, hopefully it's not being tackled by young children, <laughs> but who knows? Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's tempting. You kind of want to, you know, crawl on that stuff. It just, it's fun. Oh, for sure. It's I mean, cool. that's, I mean, Lego's so tactile, right? And here's this, this sculpt, these, these sculptures, this exhibition where you're seeing something that we're all familiar with touching and playing with. And yet, Oh, it's no touching. And so generally, uh, at the end of every exhibition, I have an area where you can actually get your hands on some bricks and create something. Now, due to COVID reasons in the mm-hmm. pandemic and whatnot, that's gone away for now. Uh, but once once things are back to normal, we'll have an opportunity to build again at the end of exhibitions. Yeah, cool. Yeah, that that would have been a nice finishing touch to that exhibit. But right, right. what can you yeah, do now? Everyone, yeah. Even you know, kids and adults, they want to... Once they've seen it, they want to get their hands in there and, and create something themselves. I get it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so what are you working on now? Anything going on now that you're excited about? <laughs> ah, Travis, always trying to figure out what I'm working on. <laughs> no, um, I, I have some stuff coming up, but I, like many artists, do not like to talk about my work until mm-hmm. I'm ready to exhibit it. And that's, that's just the nature of, of how it, I've learned the hard way when I tell people, oh, I'm building an elephant. And they're like, they picture in their mind what that elephant should look like. And then I reveal it and they're like, oh, that, no, well, that's not what I, I thought you would do a traditional elephant. Why is it pink? You know, whatever. Um, and so I, I really do not talk about my upcoming work other than maybe I'll do some, some slight previews on Instagram once in a while. But for the most part, I, I just, I keep it busy. Now, generally, yes, I am working on something. Yes, it's exciting and new. Um, and, and the great thing is having exhibitions mean if I come up with something, I can plug it into a different exhibition and Mm. showcase it pretty quickly, um, depending on, depending on schedules and whatnot. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, very cool. Well, I mean, not being an artist, that's something I wouldn't have even thought of. So, you know, I, I can appreciate that perspective though. Yeah. You just, you know, I want to, I want to, I want to share my work in the best light, um, and even even my exhibitions, like sometimes the press will be like, "Hey, we want to come in and see you setting up." And I'm like, "Eh, I want to show you this when it's well lit and it, it looks <clears throat> the way I envision it. I don't want you to see just stuff in boxes or the the yeah. T Rex half assembled. I want to really showcase what what it's supposed to be in my mind. And so sometimes, you know, that can be frustrating for people who want to see behind the scenes. And I do share behind the scenes from time to time, but it's just how I approach it, I guess. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, but I mean, it's still, I'm curious, have you ever had a, like a, a big failure, like something you're like, you set on making, but it just, it ain't going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Half the studio is full of things like that. I mean, that's, it's part of the process as well, is that you take on projects and you think, oh, the world's going to love this. I no, no. You know, it, it just doesn't get there. Um, and the world may love it, but I'll just never show anyone. I have these things where I have, I have ideas, I build them. And then I'm like, eh, no. And I, and I've destroyed pieces. I've destroyed tons of pieces, finished pieces where I'm just like, this is, this did not turn out how I wanted it to. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's, again, I, I feel like I have responsibility to put out works that inspire folks that are, are what I envision is something out there that when people see it, they're, they're touched by it. They, they have some sort of emotion because of it. And so if I don't like how it looks, it's not going to see the light of day. So mm-hmm. projects come and go um, from time to time. I usually have two to three projects going on at any given time, uh, which, which means there's all sorts of things going on in here. 
constantly. But I work yeah. I work here in this studio for the most part alone. It's just me and the dog, and that's it. Yeah. Now, I do have other people I work with on projects, uh, but when it comes to my space, this is just for me. Yeah. No, that's cool. I can I can relate to that a bit because, I mean, c- kind of getting into Lego sets, it's like I'll just get in a zone. And, I mean, that's different because I'm, I'm closely following the instructions that Lego has so – you know, lovingly provided for me. Right. Uh, but yeah, I can get the the vibe where you just get in like a, a zone mentality and it's, it's almost meditating. It's great. I love yeah, it. exactly. Um, well, man, this is awesome. I just, I'm so glad you, you got to, you came on here, Nathan. It's so fun yeah. talking to you about all this stuff. And I, you know, I love hearing about, you know, the story of how it got started and how you're able to do this. It's just uh, very cool. I'm, I appreciate you being around it. And, and uh, what I really appreciated too was, you know, Going into the exhibit, it was it was awesome to kind of walk in and all the see stuff that I was familiar with, with all the you know like American Gothic and whatever, right. and uh, that was really fun. But then after that, it's it was great to see your your own work too. You know, we really like that. Thanks. Yeah, well, and that was the idea. You know, when we laid out the exhibition, is to introduce you something you know that you're familiar with right off the bat. Okay, mm-hmm. here's the Mona Lisa. I know the Mona Lisa. Mona Lisa out of Lego. I get it. And then you move into more original works and, and, you know, a lot from there. So that's, that's the concept is to really rope people in and make sure they have a good time and, and kind of hopefully, as I said, inspire them and, and make them think a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it makes me want to try building something that's not a set, you know, something on my own, but I feel like I don't, do you have any recommendations? Cause I don't really have the space for, you know, 10 million Legos or whatever it is, you know? So like, uh, how would I even get what I need? Well, I mean, there's always just, you can buy boxes of, of, you know, regular Lego bricks, pieces, just random pieces. You don't have to buy the sets. You generally have to buy them online, like from lego.com and, but mm-hmm. they still sell just a big box of Lego. And that's my first set was just like, a universal building set. It was just a bunch of bricks, some doors, some windows, some tires. That's that's what got me started. And they still sell sets like that, you know, kits okay. like that, where you just get a bunch of loose bricks and just let your imagination run wild. Uh, there's, you know, there's no wrong way to do it. There's no wrong way. There's no rules to Lego. I know some folks say, oh, there's specific building rules. I disagree completely. I, of course, I disagree because one of the main rules that some people have is, you cannot glue Lego. Well, yeah. I glue Lego. And, and and when you get in there and you're building, you, sh- you know, just, again, have fun and not worry about rules and not worry about how it looks. Just do your best. I mean, it took me years to get to this point. Uh, I had to figure out how I could take rectangular bricks and mold them, build them into a curve. I mean, that's one of those those techniques that you have to learn how to take rectangled pieces make them into what appears to be a curve and that's that's why using lego bricks works so well from my perspective is that you do see these sculptures and you see them up close and there are all these right angles and these squares and rectangles and then you back away and all those sharp corners blend into those curves and that's really the magic that's that's why i love using lego bricks Mm -hmm. i mean this is i'm no art history major or anything here but so i don't want to D- you know, dive into while that's too deep for me. But uh, I was thinking it's kind of like the the pointillism style, right? Where there's just consist of a bunch of little dots. And then up close, it's like, it's just dots, but you step away and it becomes something. Is that, do you kind yeah. of see a similarity with that? Oh, for sure. For sure. Okay. A lot of people have said my work looks very pixelated or, or voxelated, right? Because it's, it is just these little squares and rectangles. Exactly. In fact, that's what made that connection when I started working with the photographer, Dean West, on our collaborations is because, you know, he does digital photography, which is just a bunch of pixels. And, and that's really all my Lego sculptures are in a way. Yeah. And so integrating those two together made sense. Yeah, no, very cool. Yeah, those that was a cool part of the exhibit too. Um, yeah, we gotta we gotta tell people where they can go check oh. out your exhibit or see photos or anything like that. Where people that are listening, I'm, they're dying to see this stuff. I'm sure. Um, so where can we send them? Well, you can always go to brickartist.com to see the latest schedules for the Art of the Brick exhibitions. Right now, we're open in Amsterdam and we're open in Los Angeles at the California Science Center, which is near USC. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, very cool. Any social media, anything like that you want to send people to? I mean, if you want to follow me on Instagram, it's just at Nathan Sawaya. And from there, um, that's really about it. (laughs) Cool. No, that's great, man. Yeah, highly recommend the the exhibit to anyone listening. That was so fun. It was just such a, I didn't even know what I was really in for. So it was such a shock. But uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks. uh, Thanks for coming on, Nathan, sharing all this stuff. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.